before you. And Lord, we, there's so much to pray about. I, I think of Ukraine. Sometimes we, we pray that and it hasn't really come up for a while, but I, I lift it this evening, Ukraine and Russia. I pray that that conflict can come to a peaceful solution. So many lives are being killed. So much heartache. And I pray, Lord, that you could intercede, that war would end peacefully, that your will be done. We pray for that. I think of Afghanistan. I think of our brothers and sisters that are in those countries, and, you know, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, China. The list goes on. And we see there's so much we don't see, and our brothers and sisters are being tortured behind the scenes for the cause of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you strengthen them. And Lord, I just pray that your hand be upon our brothers and sisters that are suffering persecution. And I pray that your glory and your will be done. And to you be all the praise and all the honor on the glory. And so we lift them up to your throne right now, their families and their loved ones and them themselves. I just thank you for this day. I pray as we break open the word that it, it, it really changes. I'm thinking of, it says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that not needed to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So Lord, help us to study, help us to rightly divide so that we can be in truth. So when the enemy comes in with his voices and his persuasions, that we not be seduced by his voice, but Lord, that we hear your voice and we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Thanks, God. Well, good evening, everyone. We taking communion today? No. It's extra. How are we doing? So we must be tired again, because everybody's over here. They couldn't make it all the way over here. It's okay. It happens on Wednesdays. We are in First Kings chapter three. And maybe we will get two chapters done, maybe. Uh, there's a lot of names in the second chapter, and just giving you a little heads up, I make them up. I'm not very good at reading some of that, but uh, I'll get as close as I can, and whatever I can't uh, really read, I'll just make it up. And I'll give it a shot, so... But it'll be wrong, and that's not a problem. We get to heaven if some of them are there. They can explain to us their names. So. But uh, we have, uh, before I get started, a um, couple of things. want to encourage you this weekend, this Friday is home groups. If, you're not, if you don't go to one, you should. Uh, it's, it's important, uh, as much as you possibly can, uh, to get the word of God. It's, it's important. It strengthens our faith. faith. It uh, builds friendships, uh, these home groups. Uh, anytime we meet together, it, it strengthens and builds each other up. You know, as the times will get darker and darker, and they're dark now, but they're going to get darker, and we need stuff like that, and we need to be uplifted. We need to have somebody we could pray with. We need to have somebody we could fellowship with, and, and it's important, and I know that the Wednesday group is different than Sundays because you guys worked all day or something, and here you are out at night, uh, you know, and uh, here you are because you want to hear the Word of God, and, and it's all important. Anytime you can fellowship, it's very important. The men's ministry, the women's ministry, uh, it, it's also very important. It, um, so uh, also... You know, uh, if, you, if you can't go out at night, uh, that you have, for, for you women, uh, you have the Saturday grazing in the Word. And I know it's not every week, uh, but it's very fruitful and it's very filling. There's a lot of, uh, you, can, you can glean off of a lot of things and a lot of people in there as well. And uh, We have the marriage thing coming up. Uh, sign up. It's, it's important. It's important to understand why we do things well it's understand it, it, it's important for you ladies to understand why us not headed guys uh, do some of the things we do why we think the things we do and 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 why uh, 
you know, for us guys, why uh, you ladies can just talk and about seven different subjects, and we're still on the first one, which was 40 minutes ago. And, and so it, it's really important to understand one another, and, and no matter how good you think your marriage is, uh, you know, if you look at, at it in light of Scripture, it pales in comparison. So, and I know that, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we really think we have a very good marriage, um, but we get on each other's nerves. And sometimes, and most of the time, uh, I'm not very understanding. Uh, I'll be thinking about something over here, and she'll be talking to me, and of course, I'm still thinking about something over here. And uh, did you hear what I said? You know, I just jumped off the Empire State Building, huh? Oh, yeah, that's great, honey. So, but uh, anyway, just to throw that out there, and even if you're, you're not married uh, and you, you've been married, there's always an opportunity to learn marriage God's way so that you might be able to sit down next to somebody and say, you know, this is what God's word says. And that's the whole point of this. So, you know, the more we can rely on God's word, the better off we'll be. Amen? Amen. All right, First Kings chapter 3, we've seen David is gone. Uh, one of David's sons, Adonijah, tried to take over the kingdom. He tried to steal it, uh, just like his brother Absalom did. Uh, it didn't work out. They had told David what was going on. David, gave, uh, by the leading of the Lord, gave uh, some great uh, things to do, and they did it. Solomon was proclaimed king. Adonijah was afraid, but Solomon didn't kill him. But before David passed away, uh, he told his son Solomon, look, this, you know, don't forget what Joab did because he murdered innocent people. And we talked about that and, and whether David was trying to get even with Joab or, or these other two people or whether uh, he was not. And the answer was when we looked at it that he wasn't trying to get even with them. But God's word said that the ground, the land would be defiled for murder. And so the, the penalty had to be paid. And in reality, uh, they brought it upon themselves. And we, we saw that last week. Uh, Solomon gave uh, you know, them information what they needed to do or what they not needed to do. Uh, Shimei, actually, he got executed. And Solomon had grace on him. And he said, hey, you know what? As long as you don't leave your city, you're good. As soon as you leave, you're going to give up your life. And what did he do? He left. He went after his, his servants that had escaped from him, and maybe they knew that he couldn't leave, that it would cost him his life. But, you know, it, it, he took off anyway, and he went and chased down these two guys, and it cost him his life. And that's where we left off last week. So as we come into this week, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Now, this is, this, these two chapters, three and four, cover about three years. They, uh, Solomon was a, was a young guy. Um, I've heard anywhere from 15 to 18. We don't really know for sure, and God didn't point it out, so we can just say, hey, 15 to 18. He was a young guy either way. He was a young guy either way. But look at what he did. Um, it says he made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So in them days, if you made a treaty and you gave your daughter or something, it was a, it was a good treaty for those who gave away. Because at the time, uh, Israel was pretty much the king nation around. They were the toughest dog in the kennel. So anybody that would come to them to say, hey, you know, let's make a treaty, they wanted, to be, they wanted to make this treaty so that they could protect themselves from you attacking them. Or maybe somebody else attacking in them, and they could come in and say, hey, you know, uh, we're friends of Israel, so, you know, you're fighting Israel as well. And what did he do? He gave uh, Solomon his daughter, which... 
starts a bad habit. Number one, God said that you should marry amongst your own people. He did not. Uh, and it, it started, this was number one wife of 700 wives. Now imagine that. 700 mother-in-laws. <laughs> Think about that. I see that puts it in a different perspective because 700 wives, eh, you know, but 700 mother-in-laws. See, we can all relate to that, can't we? But not only that, but then he goes and he multiplies when God told him not to and has 300 concubines. I wonder how big their table was. I wonder if they had loudspeakers or they had runners, you know, run down to the other end of the table and tell them we're going we're gonna to say grace. Or maybe these people on this end over here finished their dinner an hour and 45 minutes before the people down on the other end. Because 700 wives, that's a lot. But 300 concubines, man. So none of this was good for Israel. So he, the, the beneficiary of this treaty that they're having is Egypt because they now get protected. And it says here, <clears throat> in the city of David, until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. So what he's going to do is he's going to build his own house, which is going to take about 13 years. And we'll get to that in, uh, a little later. Uh, and he's going to build the house of the Lord, which is going to take him seven years, which we'll get to in chapter 6. He'll start building the house. It says, Meanwhile, uh, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Now, it, in then days, they had the tabernacle uh, with the ark in it that David built, right? And then you had in Gibeon, you had the original tabernacle when they came over with Moses. The ark of the covenant wasn't there, but the brazen altar was so that they could do sacrifices. But here it says what? They sacrificed at the high places. Now, there's a problem with that. Why? Well, the high places were, if I can get closer to God, so I'm going to go in the high places, go up on top of the mountains, and I'm going to go up there and pray because now I'm closer to God, so God's going to honor that more. Is that true? Absolutely not. It's absolutely not true. And most of the time, all of the Gentile nations... They sacrificed where? In the high places, up on top of the mountain. And they sacrificed to their gods. Well, it's a no-no. They shouldn't be doing it. You know, thank God that we as believers could sit right here in our chair right now and be a living sacrifice like we talked on Sundays, on Sunday, be a living sacrifice and call out to the Lord and pray to him and give our heart and our will unto the Lord. We don't have to go up on top of a mountain or crawl up a hill over glass to worship some statue or some figure or do all these things. But we're saved by grace, just like they are, but they haven't accepted that. Just like Israel was told not to do it, but they did it anyway. And just like us sometimes, God tells us not to do it, and yet we do. So here it says, Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the house, at the high places, because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. You know, when your leader, when your leader is doing that, there's a problem in the nation. 
And this is what's going to happen. It's a small picture. And it says here, it says Solomon loved the Lord and he walked. He lived a lifestyle in the beginning in the statutes of his father David. The standard. The one that was a man after God's own heart. And you're going to see a difference between these two. Solomon was political. He just made a bargain to deal for a treaty with Pharaoh. Took his wife as a down payment, basically. But he was a political type guy. He was a builder. He built extravagant things. He lived in luxury, is what he did. Now David was different, wasn't he? David was, he lived a simple life. David was a shepherd. David took care of God's people and he loved God, and he served him by serving God's people. You know, you want to know what a servant is? They're serving the Lord by serving God's people. And it's a shame today that we can look around and look on the TV and look at some other things, and it's always the same thing. What is it that you can do for God? Oh, and by the way, you have to do it through me. It's not the pastor or the leaders, the elders. It's not the church, the body of Christ, serving one another. It's, hey, what can you do for me? What can I get out of it? And it's a sad state of affair, but here you have Solomon who loved God. And for a period of time, he lived his lifestyle in the statutes of his father. David was the standard at the time. Now, Jesus Christ is our standard, isn't he? And so here, uh, now the king went to uh, Gibeon. Now, that's where the, Moses' tabernacle was to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. So you had these other high places, but the tabernacle in Gibeon was the great high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. I, I just wonder how long that took. Because a burnt offering, you didn't get to share it. You didn't get to eat with the burnt, whatever the burnt offering was. You had to totally consume it. And it, the fire had to burn it completely. A thousand burnt offerings. But this was a showing of Solomon consecrating his life to God. A thousand burnt offerings. And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness, uprightness of heart with you, and you have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on the throne as it is this day. Now, it's interesting because Solomon says you've shown great mercy. He obviously knew about David's sins, David's shortcomings, David's murder of Uriah, and the taking of a married woman, his adultery. And he says... You have shown great mercy. And he says that his father was a servant. And that's what David was. And he says about him, now listen to what he says, because he walked before you in truth. You know, David sinned a lot. David did a lot of stupid things. But he loved God. And his heart was always towards God. He never turned his heart away. And in reality, he always trusted God. And in times, he might not have shown it. He had a lack of faith. But it says right here now, remember, this is the Holy Spirit saying this. That he walked before you in truth, in righteousness. Now think about that for a minute. Was David very righteous? No. Did a lot of wrong things. How does God look at us? Righteous. We do a lot of dumb things, right? I mean, I can't count on one hand just today. But see, God looks at us in that same righteousness. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. See, David looked ahead 
and saw his son sitting on the throne forever in the name of Jesus Christ. He trusted in him for his salvation. Why? Because he trusted in God and in what God said. It makes all the difference in the world. And we know that, and we've lived that, haven't we? And we've known that we trust the Lord. And at times we can fade and falter. But he's always faithful. It's always us that's not. But he says, in truth, he walked in truth. He lived a lifestyle in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart. And you have continued this great kindness. God's mercy never, ever, ever fails. And his mercies are new every single morning, aren't they? And we know that. And we know that he's been merciful to us, us who, desire, who deserve the penalty of death. But his mercy and grace, his love for us, and he did whatever it took to save us. And so here it says, Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father. Now it's interesting, he says, Now, O Lord, who? My God. We don't hear that very often, do we? And a lot of these, a lot of these guys, King Saul and some of the other ones, it's, it's always your God, King David. It's always your God, your God. But here Solomon says, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know what to go out or come in. Now that's an interesting thing that he would say because in the next, uh, I think it's in the next verse, He's going to ask for something. And that actually took a lot of wisdom to do that. But he says here, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. So I need your help. I'm just a little child. I'm, I'm still sucking on the bottle. And I have no idea what I'm doing. And you know what? In reality, for us who serve the Lord, we should always feel that way. Because we really don't know, do we? But it's God that gives us wisdom. It's God that gives us understanding to know. To know. I believe it's uh, first or second John. And it says that we know all things. Well, I don't know all things. But I know the Holy Spirit who lives in me knows all things. And he can tell me. And so here he's saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know my hat from a handbag. I don't know what I'm doing. He says, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. What an awesome responsibility for Solomon. But in reality... What an awesome responsibility for us. If you sit here today as a parent, you have an awesome responsibility to your children, don't you? If you're a grandparent, you have an awesome responsibility to your children and your grandchildren. If you sit here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have an awesome responsibility, don't you? To tell of God's love. You know, and maybe you don't have a script or something like that, but you just tell them what God has done in your life. We are responsible. We are responsible for what God has given us. You remember back in chapter 24 of Matthew, several I don't know when it was. It was several months ago. And, and uh, Jesus told the, uh, the story of the talents and how he gave them to the three people. And I'm not talking talent, like you have a talent. You could sing or dance or, or whatever. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about what are you doing with what God's given you? Okay, you have salvation. What are you doing with it? God has given you a gift. We're gonna, uh, this Sunday when we're in Romans, we're going to talk about that. The things that God has given, what are you doing with them? 
Are we just holding on to them or are we bearing them? Are we using that gift so that there's a multiplication? And, and so here, Solomon is saying, look, you've got way too many people. And there ain't no way I can do this. What an awesome responsibility for him. But you know what? The great thing about Solomon at this time was is he knew he could go to God. He knew it. And sometimes as Christians, we forget that. That might be the third or fourth thing that we think of, or the fifth, or even further if you're like me. I always think, well, let me call so-and-so. All right, when I get done with that, and let me call so-and-so over here. Let me call this person. Oh, let me call this person. Well, what about the Lord? He's sitting there going... Oh, boy, you know, I could help you out of this real quick if you uh, just let me know, you know, if you want me to help out. I can. I could do this for you. I really can. And he says, therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart or a, uh, a hearing heart, one that hears God something that all of us needs. To judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. You know, what would you ask the Lord if he said to you, okay, what can I do for you? Well, You know, I've always dreamed of having a Maserati so I could get lots of tickets. Not just several or many, but lots. Catch me if you can. I don't know if that would be one thing now, but what is it that you would ask of the Lord? What is it that you would want? Well, see, here he says... Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart, a heart that hears what God has to say so that he could discern between good and evil. He wanted to make the right choices. He wants to make the right decision. You know, it's interesting for me, uh, you know, I get faced with uh, church decisions uh, pretty much on a daily basis, and if I happen to miss a day, it multiplies. And so the next day might be four or five or six. And, 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 that, and that, it's really, uh, for me, a very uncomfortable position to be in um, because I don't have the answers. And I don't have a lot of wisdom. So, which is a good thing, and I'm not complaining, because it makes me rely upon him. It makes me stop before I open up my mouth, which I'm really good at doing. I can give you my opinion, but it isn't going to do you any good. It really isn't. But you know what? When you get the Lord's opinion and and you get the Lord's will, it will help you. And it will always, always, always work out. But see, that responsibility and so is is overwhelming. And so here, Solomon is saying, you know, hey, I just want to be able to discern between good and evil. I want to have a heart that hears your voice. He says, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? Interesting. Because Solomon, here in the beginning, is showing his heart towards God. You know, Solomon was a great starter. He started out great. But he really fizzled and faded in the end. And it's really sad. And as we're going to go through this, we're going to see the mistakes that he makes that cause his heart to change away from God and towards idols of the world. The worship of his wives and concubine instead of a heart for the nation of Israel a worship of Gentile idols and the way other kingdoms do it instead of the way God had set it up that they would be, that the nation of Israel would be separate, that they would be holy and separate from the world. 
and how little by little things got to eat away. Because it's not the big thing. You know, we, I could come to any of you today and say, hey, you know, Satan wants you to do this. Well, I can guarantee you, you're going to get mad and you're not going to want to do it. But you know what? When it's so many little tiny things here and there and you know, it's okay. You know, you don't want to hurt this pe person's feelings, so just go ahead and lie. It's all right. You're saving them some agony. Oh, you know what? It's, it, it, it's okay. You know, everybody steals from their boss, you know? Everybody talks on their phone and getting paid for it when they're at work. Everybody does it. And the little things, the little things, the little things, and they add up. That's why God said, faithful in the little things, more is given. And we have to watch, and we're going to see this as an example to you and me. Because remember, this was not written to Solomon. It was written to you and me. So that we would understand. And already we've seen, he's made, an, uh, you know, he made the king of Egypt, or the pharaoh of Egypt, an ally by taking his daughter as a wife. Satan's really working there. Hey, I can get him on this little thing, and then we'll do the next little thing. Oh, and by the time you're done, you're going to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. So the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. I, I look at that and I kind of chuckle when God said, you don't ask for these things. Because I think, you know, here's, here's God thinking, okay, here we go. This guy's going to ask me for long life and riches and, you know, and just, just give a lightning bolt down to my enemies. These were probably the hits of the day going to the Lord and saying, Lord, you know, here I am. I'm your, you know, I, I'm your son. I'm a son of Abraham. And, you know, I'm an offspring of David. I'm a priest and stuff like that. Don't make me like these Gentiles, you know. Don't, you know, don't make me like the dogs. Don't make me a woman. Because that's what they would pray. And it was all about self. So it's interesting that God said, you didn't ask these stuff, but I'm going to give them to you as a bonus because you asked what was right. And he says, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any, any like you arise after you. And did you notice that? He says, I have done I have given, he's already done it. God's already given him wisdom. God's already given him understanding. And he's the most wisest person in the world. I didn't say that, the scripture just said it. The scripture just said it. You know, it's interesting when you think about wisdom and God, what God gave to, um, to Solomon, is that available to us? Absolutely, right? Uh, flip over to James chapter 1. If you would, it's the book after Hebrews. We're going to pick up in verse 5. Actually, you know what? Let's, uh, let's pick up in verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you have fallen into trials, various trials. So not if, but when you're going to fall into a trial, right? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So when we have trials, it's what? To what? It tests our what? Faith, right? And what does that, in the, what does that testing produce? patience, right? Or completeness, right? Or endurance. Endurance for the next time, right? And it says, but let patience 
have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Did you catch that? Lacking nothing. And it says in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him or her. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What is it saying? If you desire wisdom because you don't understand what you're going through, ask. But believe. Trust that he's going to give you that answer. That you're going to have an understanding of what God has and what God is doing in your life. And see, that's where most of us kind of falter, isn't it? Oh, yeah, Lord, I trust you, but why can't you do it this way? It would be so much easier for me. No, it wouldn't be. Well, it might be, but that's not the point. The, pain, the point is what? To test your faith so that it produces patience. It produces endurance so that the next time you can be the one with the faith as you speak to somebody who's going through a trial. You know, I uh, never was much of a drinker, so when people tell me that, uh, you know, they're alcoholics and they're coming on, I don't really understand that. I know sin is sin. I know that. But I don't have, I, I mean, I can point you to the Scripture, but I might not have the compassion that somebody else that would, that, that struggled with alcoholism or pornography, or greed, or lying, or deception. But see, we go through those things sometimes in our life, and God pulls us through it. He comes alongside us, and, and in, in our darkest hour, He picks us up and carries us through these things. He doesn't let us go on alone. And he says here in verse thing, and I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches, honor, that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you, if you walk, now this is conditional, isn't it? If you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been had been a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. So this is the beginning of Solomon's reign. And we're going to see good, and we're going to see bad. And now... You know, this is, this is always the thing. When God gives you something, now he gives you an opportunity to use it. And here we go. And he says, Now two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. Now, <clears throat> they came to the throne. They couldn't go to the elders. They couldn't go to the judges. And you're going to see why. Because there's going to be no witnesses. They purely needed pure wisdom from God. There's no witnesses. We can't go to court. This is unsolvable. And we're going to see this. And one woman said, Oh, my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. So you had these two harlots living together uh, in, in a house, and she gives birth and she, they, it was just them two. And it says, Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth. And we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. So there were no witnesses to say, you know, how to solve this problem. Oh, yeah, this or this. There's no witnesses. Um, <clears throat> so they come to the king to decide their fate. 
And it says, And this woman's son died in the night because she laid on him. How sad. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. We get the picture here. They both had children three days apart. One of them dies because they laid on it. So the one who laid on their son picked up their son and gave it to the other woman and uh, put her there and took the live one with them. Kind of interesting. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was dead. But when I had examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, no, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. So uh, it's, it's not something that, you know, hey, this is my son. No, it's my son. No, it's my son. No, it's my, you got the dead son. No, 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 you got the dead son. How do you solve that? Well, God can solve it, right? And the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is dead one. And the other one says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Well, interesting. What do you do as the king? Well, it says, then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword to be before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. You know, it's interesting. What did Solomon just do? He didn't listen to what they were saying. There was no way that he was going to be able to solve anything. So what did he do? So here, what's said is, it, it's, it's a matter of the heart for both these women. So to get to the heart of the matter, you must look at the heart. And this is what Solomon is going to do. Because the problem is not of the heart, but the problem is the heart. You had one woman who loved their child and the other one who's stealing someone's child. So he, Solomon says, cut it in half. And then in verse 26, he says, Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son, and she said, O oh my Lord, Give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other one said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. One heart was cold, and one heart had compassion. One heart was the heart of Satan, and the other heart was the heart of the Lord. See, Satan, all he wants to do is kill and destroy. And the Lord wants to give life, and life abundantly. You know, the world doesn't care. They just want a piece of you. Just like Satan. Hey, you know, here's these people in the church. Just let me get a finger in there. And let me take a finger. Because if I could get that finger, then I got a toehold. And I got a foothold. And it's not only like that in the church, but it's also like that in our lives, isn't it? Just wants a place to grab onto so he could take you down. Interesting how Solomon says, well, you know what? I'm going to cut you in half. And you're going to get half. And you're going to get half. In other words, the boy's going to die. But the real mother, the real mother of that child said, okay, well, you could live with that person, just stay alive. But the other one was cold-hearted. And if, you know what? If I can't have it, no one can. No one's going to get it. If I can't have that kid, she can't have it either. So I'd rather have that kid die. And unfortunately, today, people make that choice, don't they? 
It's so unfortunate. You know, you, you, you see it in the church today. It's, it's, it's really sad. You uh, see people who rather divide a church to get what they want, to divide the body of Christ to get what they want so that they could have what they want. It doesn't matter what's good for the body of Christ, but it only matters to them what's good for them. And it's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. It, it's too bad to see. And, 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 and don't be deceived because it's like that in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, it is. They'd rather divide and get their own way than to say, you know what? Let me go quietly into the night because that's the right thing to do instead of trying to tear down the body of Christ. And here you have a, 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 an example of two women. But here you also have the wisdom of a man, a young man. Why? Because he sought the Lord and what the Lord had. How would you decide something like that? Only God can. Only God can. And it says, So the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. Kill him. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which is the, the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice that's a pretty awesome thing but see they feared they feared now is it that they reverenced the king no they feared why because it was god's judgment and god knew everything and god knows everything and instead of them having a relationship with god they feared god and they ran away from him you remember when uh, God was speaking and the people were going, no, no, no. And they stopped up their ears and they said, just tell Moses. And Moses could tell us. We can't listen anymore. Well, that's not a relationship and that's not what they wanted. They wanted a figurehead of God. And that's the way they treated Jesus as well. Because they didn't want a servant to come and die for their sins, for the things that they did. Because number one, they would have to admit that they did something wrong. They didn't want it left in God's hands. They wanted to do it on their own. And unfortunately, it's the way of man today. Look around the world. You know what? If we could take God out of everything, He doesn't exist. I don't have to be responsible for the things I do. Lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's the deception of Satan because he just wants a piece of you. And if he can hang on to that piece, if he can hang on to that fingernail, then he can get a toehold. And he can come into your life and try to destroy you. And we as believers need to understand that. And we need to ask God for wisdom. And we need to serve the Lord with our whole heart, not part of it, not whatever's left over. Lord, I got five minutes before I fall asleep. Actually, Lord, now that I think about it, you got three minutes because I'm tired and I fall asleep pretty quick. Right, honey? I mean, it's funny because I get into bed, she turns off the light and turns toward me, I'm already out. I fall asleep really quick. But see, we can be that way, can't we? Lord, you know, I'm in a hurry this morning. I woke up late because I stayed up late. So, you know, I'm sorry we don't have any time together this morning. It's so important for us to spend time in his word. It's so important, as Solomon said, that he, it says here about Solomon that he loved God. And that he walked in his ways. He lived a lifestyle. 
And, and you know, for some of us that are here tonight, we need to say, you know what, what how much does God really mean to me? How much do I really trust him? How, do, how does this really work? Do I really trust him with my heart, my whole heart? Do I want him to speak to my heart? Do I want him to tell me things? Or, or you know, I know pretty much everything. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need prayer. Don't do that. I don't need that. But we all need it because we can all be deceived. And our own hearts, our hearts are desperately wicked. Well, wait a minute now. You know, I'm saved. I, you know, I got a pure heart. Nope. It's not what the scripture says. And they will deceive us. But see, God won't. He's always there, never leaves us, never forsakes us. Paid for our sins, provided a way out, gave us grace and mercy, mercy that's new every morning. You know, when we were Romans, Paul said in chapter 12 this past Sunday, in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Living, not dead ones. Not moping, oh, oh man, it's Sunday. I gotta go to church. I can't take it. That guy up there is gonna make me feel bad. I'm gonna feel bad. He's gonna expose all my sins. He's gonna tell me all these things I did and he knows how I feel. Well, I can't even look at him. I gotta pretend I'm asleep or maybe go to sleep. dread but see we should be excited to go because we get to be with one another we get to hear the word of God we get to fellowship we get to pray for each other well I don't know you know I could do that but if it wasn't for my husband or if it wasn't for my wife or if it wasn't for my kids you know I got to drag them out in the morning to go to church. I could think of other things to do. You know, if it was uh, January through uh, April, I could go golfing in the morning. Who wants to go to church when you could go out in the beautiful weather that God created so that you could go out there and play golf? Why would you want to be stuck in there with a whole bunch of people? Come on. Does that sound like anybody? But see, God says, I love you. I want to spend time with you. I want to fellowship with you. I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to be sad. I want, I want to increase your faith so that you could trust in me. So that you could be part of my family. And when you're done doing the work I've called you to do, you could come into heaven with me where I've created a wonderful place for you. Where you'll have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And your husband will be a husband that will die for you because he already did. Well, that sounds a lot better than, you know, maybe riches and things and getting even with my enemies. Although I kind of like that enemy thing once in a while. You know, God's always provided, so I guess I don't need riches. He's already made me rich. He's made me rich in love and in mercy and grace. And that's what he's called us to give away. Do we understand? Do we understand in this story about this woman, you have two hearts, one towards God and one not. One for life, and one for death. Do you understand in the difference between David and his son Solomon? You know, Solomon wrote a lot of stuff, which I was hoping we'd get to it tonight, kind of tie it together, but we'll do it next week. You know, he wrote a lot of stuff, but um, he wrote a lot of um, songs, 
a lot of songs. But really, there's only two, and I think it's Psalms 72, and I know 72 is right, and I think the other one's like 125, and then you had the Song of Solomon. The rest of them are not recorded. But you look at all the ones that David recorded. Why? Because at the end of Solomon's life, his heart had changed. It was bitter. It was rock hard. And Solomon didn't finish well. He started out good. Sound like somebody else? Sound like Saul? Uh, Saul? King Saul, remember? He started out real good. He was like a tender plant, Samuel said. He was humble. And he loved the people. And then it became all about him. So what do we learn from this? Well, we certainly don't want to be cold-hearted and bitter like this woman. And we certainly don't want to give up, do we? You know, so I just want to encourage you, stay in the Word of God. No matter what the circumstances come about, God can overcome all of them. All of them. Amen? So if you stand with me, worship team will come up. If you need prayer, come on up. If you think you don't need prayer, come on up anyway because you're not thinking right. I always need prayer so you can pray for me. So. And you can pray for Johnny because he's got issues. And if you call him on the phone, he'll tell you that. I got issues. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word this evening. Lord, we thank you for the word in our lives. We thank you for the many examples so that we don't have to go through some of these things that you're pointing out to us. Father, we thank you for, to let us see the wisdom of Solomon and how he handled that situation. But Father, we ask also for wisdom. We ask for wisdom to know when you're speaking to us and when you're not. We ask for the wisdom to whether we turn to our right hand or to our left. We ask for wisdom so that we can discern between the wiles of the enemy and the world and the love and grace that you have. Father, we ask for wisdom and understanding that our hearts would be changed, that we as men can love our wives as you loved the church and died for it. And Father, for that we can respect and love and honor one another. Father, that uh, we can truly be called sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So Father, we love you and we praise you. And Father, I ask that you bless each and every one here from the top of their head to the bottom of their foot. Lord, I ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon each and every one here. And Father, we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said,